welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Father, I thank you for the, the amazing, amazing ministry of the Holy Spirit. That you did not leave us as orphans, but you sent him to us to not just bring us into your kingdom, but Lord, to teach us. He is the teacher and the revelator of the church. So we humbly submit to you, Holy Spirit. We ask that you'd come and teach us and open the word to us and open our eyes and our hearts and our ears. Father, we thank you for the great, great body of Christ across the earth today, especially those that are our brothers and sisters here in the Inland Empire. We bless them today. We ask that you'd prosper their churches. You'd grow them, Lord, that your will would be done in every house of God that names Jesus as Lord. Father, we lift up our nation to you. We thank you, God, that you've allowed us to be in a nation that is free. We ask that you would help our leaders, Lord, to make right choices and right decisions, that we may lead peaceable and godly lives. And so we bless your name. We thank you for your word. And we all said, amen, in Jesus' name. If you got your Bibles, if you turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 22, I want to address today the topic that we have been on for the last seven weeks, and that is God's economic recovery program. We are in a season here at The Rock, and I'll I'll talk a little bit about this after the message, but we're in a new season. God works in times and seasons. To everything there is a season, a time, and a purpose under heaven, and every season and time of God has its purposes, his divine purposes in it. And so... We've been speaking on finances, and there's always the reticence of pastors to, to talk too much about money because the, the, typical, the typical observation and feeling that we can get from the congregation is all you want is money. And, of course, the unbelievers will definitely give us a hard time and say that the church is only after money. Well, if that was true, then you wouldn't be here. We're not after your money. We are after your hearts. But God speaks a lot about the economies of our lives. And God is a king. He is the king. He has the kingdom. Jesus came preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. He came showing and telling what God was like. He's the express image of God. He is the replication of God. He's a divine image of God. When you and I couldn't see him, we can see Jesus. So if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. And Jesus spoke about finances, and he spoke about the kingdom of God and how finances operate in it. So God is not against wealth. He's the God that gives wealth. He gives the power to get wealth that his covenant can be established. God is not against us prospering. Prosperity is a gift from God. It doesn't mean if you're rich that God's favoring you, but it means that prosperity in body, soul, and spirit in every which way, from your mind to your will, your emotions, your family, everything that your hand touches, that it's blessed by God. That is the will of God. So we've been teaching on finances, and God has been teaching us out of the Word of God. And to me, it's it's life-changing because I realize that God actually has an incredible plan. And if we slip into the slipstream of that plan, and if we actually do His plan, and if we do what He says, we'll we'll be blessed, we'll prosper. The, The word blessing means the power to succeed, and God wants us to succeed. He's not called us to fail. He's called us to success. And so... This morning, in Genesis chapter 22, we're going to see a couple of firsts, a couple of things that you're not going to see in the Word of God until Genesis chapter 22. One of the things that we're going to see is His name. Now, God is identified to us by His names. In the Hebrew tongue and in the Hebrew culture, names meant something very important. People didn't just name their babies because of trends. They named their babies because they meant something. The name meant something. And so we see that in chapter 22 that we're going to discover a name of God that is now uttered in the earth for the first time. And where that name is uttered for the first time, there's an event that has taken place. It displays a characteristic of God, and we need to pay attention to it. And the name that we're going to look at this morning is Jehovah Jireh. How many of you have heard the name Jehovah Jireh? Most of you in here have. Some of you haven't. It means my God shall provide. Jehovah Jireh, the God of provision. And we're going to see that in this event, when his name was first spoken, when that name was first given to us, that there was something that happened that caused the man that named him that, that spoke that, something caused him to see God in that position. Abraham is the father of faith, and Abraham is about to offer Isaac up on the mountain, and there he sees God 
replacing Isaac with a ram, and he says, my God shall provide. Now, we're going to look at that because not only is God the God of provision, the God of blessing, he's a good father. Guys, he's a good father. God's a good God. God loves us. God's not mad at us. He's not there up in heaven with a big stick ready to whack you upside the head like your grandma is. I'm a grandma. God's a good God, but he's king, and it will be done his way. This is his universe. This is his creation, and we are his people. And so he wants us to come into divine alignment. Now, the second thing we're going to see this morning is the word worship spoken for the first time. And in the law of first use or the law of first mention and hermeneutics, it means that when you see something for the first time in the word of God, that, the, that what is described, what it describes at that point in time is, is the basic meaning of that word. Unless it's found in other places at least two or three times meaning something different. So we're going to see the word worship. So this morning, we're going to look at Jehovah Jireh, the name that he provides. Speaking of economic recovery and what does all this mean about me and my finances? We're going to look at the word worship, and we're going to see how they are combined. Because you see, God is Jehovah Jireh, but I don't see him until I worship him. Now, when I say that worship, how many of you think of worship as singing? Now, you know what most of you do when you're just afraid to raise your hands because you, you think it's a test. <laughs> you can't say anything wrong. You know, a lot of times we think the worship service is the song sets. And whether they are modern and contemporary or whether they're old-fashioned or whether they're old school, new school, whether there's bells and whistles and we lower the lights in the sanctuary, we open them up, or whether we're singing with instruments or we're singing with a cappella, we think of worship as singing. And God gave us a gift of music. We are wired for music. Music does something important in our lives. But worship singing is only a part of what worship is. God is seeking people to worship him in spirit and truth. And the name, and let me just give you a definition here. Worship means to bow down, to prostrate before a superior, to humble oneself before God. And Abraham is going to use this word worship in the most difficult time and the greatest test of his life. So Abraham's not going up to Mount Moriah singing his praises. Abraham has a pathway of worship where he is going to encounter the divine God and see for the first time and give us the name Jehovah Jireh on the mountain of God, his provision will be seen. So when you and I want to see and need to see the God of all provision, Jehovah Jireh, we need to know that there is a pathway to that name and that there is a way to get there. And so this morning, I want to give you three things. This is exhaustive. We could be in this chapter for months, but I want to give you three things this morning, simple things that will get you and get me on that pathway of worship so that we can meet Jehovah Jireh and see him meet the needs that we have in our lives. Are you ready? Genesis 22. I'm going to read quickly. I'm a pretty good reader with my glasses on. So hang on. Here we go. Now it came to pass, chapter 22, verse 1. After these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now let me just give you a quick, 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 quick history. He is now had Isaac. Isaac is a young man, a teenager or a young man. He's a lad. He's not a baby. He's already left his country, he's already had his miracle son. He was 100 when Isaac was born. Sarah was 90. He's already dismissed Ishmael from his camp because Ishmael and Isaac could not cohabit because Ishmael could not take the blessing from Isaac. And Isaac has been promised by God the miracle child because Abraham and Sarah couldn't have Isaac until they couldn't have Isaac. Because God is showing us something. That Isaac, the promised son, the new covenant, that which is coming from Isaac, a nation, and out of a nation, a savior, and out of a savior, the church, that's us, that this son will be a miracle child that cannot be produced by human effort. It will be produced by the will of God. So Isaac is a lad. Abraham's got life. He's sitting back. He's there. And God now speaks to him again. And he says, Abraham, Abraham, he says, here I am. He says, verse 2, now take your son, your only son, Isaac whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. 
So Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, he split the wood for the burnt offering, arose, went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back. This is where you see worship for the first time. The lad and I will worship. And he's not talking about singing a song. And Abraham took the wood of his burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son, took the fire on his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he says, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, placed the wood in order, bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, that's a capital A, angel, that means this is a theophany. This is not an angel speaking. This is God speaking. The angel of the Lord called to him and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and he looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. That is where he names him. Jehovah Jireh. And it's on that mountain that you're going to see him. So on that mountain of sacrifice, on that mountain of obedience, on that mountain of surrender, you and I are going to walk in the steps of the father of faith because God has told us that the just shall live by faith, that there's no other way for us to live. He's told us that we walk by faith and not by sight. He has told us that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things that we don't see with our natural eye. He has told us that we are in a supernatural kingdom. This is a supernatural God and that faith takes from the invisible realm and it brings it into the natural realm of our earth and the just shall live by faith. And this will be a faith walk up Mount Moriah. And there's three things that Abraham teaches me this morning on this pathway of worship to see Jehovah Jireh, number one. The first thing that I see in his life and that I'm going to have to have in my life, if I'm going to meet up with the God of provision, supernatural provision, I'm not just talking about any provision. I'm not talking about something natural that you can conjure up and I can conjure up. I am talking about the God of the universe coming in and doing something supernatural and meeting my needs and taking me to a place that I could never get to without him, going further than I would ever dream of going, doing more than I could ever dream of doing, and understanding things I could never understand far exceeding any human ability I could have. That's Jehovah Jireh. And if I'm going to see him in my life, the first thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to surrender myself to the word of God. I'm going to have to surrender myself to the word of God because as I said before, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing God's word. God spoke to Abraham. He said, Abraham, Abraham. Let me read it to you again. Abraham, Abraham, verse 2, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain on which I'll tell you. Now, wait a minute, God. Isaac is my only son. Ishmael's gone. All the promises that you've told me, the future, your plan, everything depends on him. God, take my son and offer him as a burnt offering. Now, a burnt offering meant that he had to be wholly consumed, completely consumed. In other words, not just did he have to die on that altar, but then he had to be burned to ashes. Now, I don't know about you, but as a parent, I'm thinking there is no way that if God told me to do that, my will and my mind could wrap itself around it. There is no way. When I'm talking about surrender, 
I'm not talking about just mentally assenting to what God says. I'm talking about the surrender that means that I've got to kill my will. I've got to crucify myself. I've got to come into divine alignment with what God has spoken, whether I agree with it or not, whether I understand it, whether it is pleasant or it is unpleasant, whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. If the word of the Lord has come to me and the word of God that is written has been spoken to me and I do not come under the authority of that word and surrender my thinking and my plans and my visions and my dreams and my ideas, then I will never get on that path to meet Jehovah Jireh, ever, ever, ever. This is a process, guys. Hebrews eleven seventeen says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered, it up, offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said in Isaac, so shall your seed be called. Concluding, verse 19, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham had to deal with the issues. He concluded. That means there was a thought process. That means there was probably great struggle. That means that Abraham had to work through the issues. And when God's word says for me to do something I don't want to do, let's take it for instance. Let's take a fight with your husband. Or how about a fight with your kids? Or how about a fight with your mother-in-law? A fight with somebody in your family. And they are wrong and you don't like it. They've hurt you. But God says you are to forgive. You are to release the offense. Love suffers long. Love doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. Love believes the best and hopes the best. 1 Corinthians 13. That's the word of the Lord. That's God speaking to me. The word is him speaking to me. If I don't surrender my hurt and my will and my desire to defend myself, to get back, to retaliate in the flesh the things that I need to do to make this thing right, if I don't surrender my will to what God has said, Debbie, love suffers long. Love doesn't take into account. Love forgives. See, when I come under the authority of that surrender, now I'm on the path of worship. Now I'm, now I'm about to meet the God of provision. You see, it's not an easy thing. It's not easy to forgive when you've been hurt. It's not easy to obey God when it doesn't make sense. So when I'm talking about surrender and the pathway to worship, I'm talking about lordship because here's the bottom line. At its core, worship is about lordship. We give lordship to what we worship. When we make the choice to worship God, we are emptying ourselves of our own rights and will and surrendering to him it proclaims a death to ourself and life to the will of God I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live and the life that I live I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me if I'm gonna meet up with Mount Moriah and if I'm gonna find Jehovah Jireh on that mountain of sacrifice it starts with surrendering my will to his word. Number two, if I'm going to get on this pathway, if I'm going to meet Jehovah Jireh, I'm going to have to sacrifice for the word, giving up the promise for the promise giver. It's going to cost me something. A sacrifice that doesn't cost is not a sacrifice. A sacrifice doesn't, that does not cost me something that I don't feel is not a sacrifice at all. In Genesis 22, verse 2, again, he said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Go to the land. And here's the test for Abraham. The test was, Abraham, do you love me enough to give me your promise? You see, Isaac was the promise. Everything was tied up in him. And sometimes we got our eyes on the promise and God has to untangle us and get our eyes back on the one who gave the promise. Are you hearing me? Sometimes we've got to get our eyes off the promise, give the promise back to him, and get our eyes on the one who gave us the promise. You see, Abraham concluded that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead, even from the ashes. Abraham passed the test. Are my eyes on the promise 
or are my eyes on the promise giver? Here's the deal. He called him to a place where he met Jehovah Jireh. This wasn't just something. He didn't have him stay in his camp. When the word of the Lord went to Abraham, God didn't say, I want you to just sacrifice Isaac right here. No, he called him to a place. There was a place where there was something that was going to happen. It was a mountain, obscure place. There was nothing there yet. It was a place of sacrifice. That place was Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah was the place that Abraham offered up Isaac. Mount Moriah, then if we travel forward into Isaac's descendants, now let's come to King David. Because Isaac obviously wasn't sacrificed. He had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. The 12 sons had the 12 tribes. And out of the 12 tribes, the tribe of Judah came forth the king, King David. And out of King David would come forth the Savior that would rule and change this world and bring us all back into reconciliation with God. And you see, there was a place that Abraham had to go to see Jehovah Jireh. And that place was Mount Moriah. So let's just travel on. And there was David. And David had sinned against God, and he'd numbered Israel, and, and Israel was dying of a plague. And God said to David, you're going to, have to, you're going to have to repent because they're dying for your sin. And David said, oh, Lord, let that not be. And so David went to find a place, and God told him where the place was to offer up a sacrifice. And it was a threshing floor. And David said, I need your threshing floor. I've got to stop this plague. I've got to offer burnt offerings. And the man that owned the threshing floor said, well, let me give it to you. Let me give you the oxen. Let me give you everything. And he said, no, I'm buying. And he paid 50 shekels of silver for it. And he said, I can't give God what costs me nothing. And he sacrificed and the plague was stopped. Let's just travel on 20 more years. Let's travel on to the next generation. Solomon now is building the temple, David's son. And when he told God, and God said, Solomon, you're going to build my house and this is where you're going to build it. You're going to build it where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. You're going to build it where David sacrificed at the threshing floor. You're going to build the temple on the threshing floor, the temple mount, and there will be my temple, and there you'll sacrifice. Now let's just move forward centuries, and let's just move forward millenniums, and there we see Jerusalem, and there we see Israel, and there we see the Messiah, the promised King of Kings, and there we see him going outside the gates in the region of Mount Moriah, and there we see him as the Lamb of God sacrificed you see there's a place there's a place there's a place where we see God in his names in our lives and God will take you to a place you don't want to go he'll take you to a season you don't want to experience he'll take you where you don't want to go but he'll say will you trust me will you trust me I work in times and seasons and I work in places I'm taking you where you don't want to go, but oh, it's in that place that you're going to meet me like you've never met me before. You're going to know me like you've never known me before. And what you have given up for me, what you have sacrificed for me, will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You cannot outgive the Father. You cannot outgive the Son. You cannot outgive the Holy Spirit. But He's leading us to worship, not to singing a song. Said that's a part, and that's a great part of this. I'm not diminishing music, but He's leading us up as a people to understand that the worship He is seeking is a worshipful heart that first surrenders, that then is willing to sacrifice. And number three, now must simply submit to the Word of God, obey it, because Abraham not just went to Mount Moriah but now he's got to do it. It's one thing to say it. Talk is cheap. Easy to say something. Comes right out of our mouths. But when it comes out of our mouths, it must be followed by a corresponding action of obedience because faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. You know, if we could just take this verse, I'd like you to go with me to the book of James. I don't think it's on the overhead, but I'm just going to read this to you. In this book, God is explaining to us by the power of the Holy Spirit that faith and works are like a body and a spirit. My body right now, you're looking at my flesh temple. It's aging, 
It's 62 years old. I have a picture of myself as a baby on my desk. I was 18 months old then. I don't look like I did then. I don't remember then. It's a temple. It houses my spirit. My soul and my spirit are eternal. Eternity is in the heart of man. So here we are. And God says, your faith without a corresponding action of obedience is like your body without your spirit. When your spirit leaves your body, your body is dead. Your body dissolves, it goes back to the ground. Your faith is like that. When you have faith, when you hear the word and you believe the word, you surrender to the word, you're willing to sacrifice, you settle the issues, now you must complete that action. That corresponding action of obedience is like the spirit to the body. Are you with me? Was not Abraham our father, chapter 2, verse 21, justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man or a woman is justified by works and not by faith. Now let's just switch the word works for obedience. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without obedience is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by obedience when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his obedience? And by obedience, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Faith without corresponding acts of obedience in doing what the word says is dead faith. It'll get you nowhere. Nothing's going to happen. We deceive ourselves. We fall into a trap. And we wonder where Jehovah Jireh is. Oh, it's quiet in this holy house. When it's time to tithe, I, I can't. I don't have any money. I can't afford to. Listen, we talked to the tithing of the training wheels on this thing. Tithing is 10%. God says, there's a God out there. It's called mammon. I'll not have and share you with anybody else. You know why? Because he's paid too much for us. He says, you cannot serve me and you cannot serve mammon. Choose this day who you'll serve. The tithe started before the law. This is not the law. We're not under the law. We are under grace. And grace understands the pathway of worship to Jeho Jehovah Jireh. That because he loved me so much and gave everything for me, the least I can do on this life is give everything I am to him, body, soul, and spirit. I have everything, but I possess nothing. I have everything, but I possess nothing. What does that mean? It means God's not against you having stuff. He is not against you believing him for a home, nice clothes on your back, a car that runs, a great job, being givers, helping somebody else. You can't help anybody else when you're in the pit. You got to get out of the pit to get somebody out of the pit. Two people in a pit can't get each other out. Come on, somebody. We're talking about money right now. This city's poor. God wants to break the back of poverty over San Bernardino, and he wants to do it with us. But until I understand the pathway of this thing and the kingdom and how it works, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to say, oh, yes, I believe God. But if I disobey him, that is really unbelief. Because unbelief has its corresponding act of disobedience, just like faith, which is belief, has a corresponding act of obedience. Now, if I seem harsh and hard, I don't mean to. I need to smile so I don't scare you. This is a learning process. This is a learning process. But if you're willing to learn, if you're willing to start somewhere. Abraham wasn't asked to offer up Isaac the day Isaac was born. God let Abraham grow and have experience with God. But I'm talking about a supernatural Jehovah Jireh. I'm talking about a God that wants to meet your needs. I'm talking about a God that wants to use you, to change your life, to use you as an instrument of his righteousness like Abraham. I'm talking about people that God wants, plain, ordinary, poor folk, plain, ordinary, rich folk, plain, ordinary sons and daughters, nothing big about us, nothing special about us, but God says, I've chosen the weak of this world to confound the wise. I've deliberately chosen the foolish of this world, the ones that aren't very stately, the ones that aren't too smart, the ones that, you know, they're a little short. 
Not the sharpest knives in the drawer. Those are my people. Why? Because just like Abraham could not have Isaac until he couldn't have Isaac. God will use a people that can do nothing on their own. But when they believe God, when they surrender, when they sacrifice, when they obey God, now he says, now I can show myself to you. Now I can be Jehovah Jireh to you. <laughs> Obedience is the work of faith. So what is God saying today in all of this stuff? Did you see that little catch just right there? Pretty good for a 62-year-old Nana. Abraham could submit to the word because he knew something. He knew. He knew that the power in the word will fulfill the promise of the word. And when he put that knife up to slay Isaac, and don't you think they had conversations going up there? Isaac wasn't stupid. He knew what was going to happen. He didn't run away from the binding. He didn't run off that mountain. He got on that altar. And when Abraham put that knife up, God cried out and said, Abraham, Abraham, stop. For now I know that you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. And he turned around, and there in the brambles was a ram, horns caught in the thicket. And God had sacrificed, and he had substituted Isaac for that ram. And then he blesses Abraham. And he says, in blessing, I will bless you. I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sands on the sea. Your children and your children's children will possess the gate of their enemies. And in you and through your seed all the nations of the world will be blessed. You see, when you surrender, when you sacrifice, and when you submit and obey to the living word of God, Jehovah Jireh has a blessing and a plan for your life. It is released in the surrender. It is released in the sacrifice. It is released in the blessing. Praise him. Father, we thank you that you are Jehovah Jireh. May our people, myself first of all, may we enter into a time and a season where we grow up, Lord. See not the things of this world, but see the magnificence of you. May we have hearts of faith and hearts of generosity, refusing fear, surrendering our plans to yours sacrificing and obeying because we believe and we know that the power in your word will surely fulfill the promise of your word to us, our children, and our children's children. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, those of you that have stayed, I do need to chat with you for a moment because what I'm about to say is extremely important. And I need to ask you up close and personal a question you probably don't like to think about because we don't really discuss it. It's not the topic of discussion at the Thanksgiving table, that's for sure. My question to you is, when you die, where are you going to open your eyes? Not if you die, but when you die. Because the Word of God tells us very clearly that it's appointed once for man to die and then judgment. And the bottom line is, is that we are all going to die. It's part of life. God didn't make us to die. He made us to live forever with Him. It was because of the fall that death came. God is the God of the living. He is not the God of the dead. But when we die, something's going to happen because the spirit that gives you life, who you are, your soul, it's not going to stay in this body. This body's going back to the earth. That's what death is, separation. I'm going to separate from this earth body, and my spirit and my soul, who I am, is going to the Father in heaven. It's God's heaven. But there's only two places where your spirit is going to go when you die. It's either God's heaven or it's hell. And hell is a very real place. 
God made it for the angels, the fallen angels and Lucifer, Satan, who'd fallen and rebelled, who wouldn't be happy in heaven. Better to rule in hell than to bow in heaven. But God didn't make you for hell. He made you for heaven. He made you in his image to live with him forever and ever. But there's only one path, one way to God's heaven. So I guess what I really should say is what makes you think you're getting into God's heaven when you die? What makes you think that? You see, the world tells us, my culture tells me that, oh, all roads lead to heaven. Why, you Christians, you're so intolerant. But you see, God doesn't say all roads lead to heaven. God didn't say the Quran and Krishna. God didn't say Buddha. God didn't say all of these world religions that have emerged over the millenniums. God didn't say those will all get you to heaven. They are all on a pathway to heaven. No. God said there's one way to heaven. Just like Mount Moriah, it's a narrow way, it's a bloody trail, and there's only one way, and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. God says, you must be born again. There is no other way. That is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Just like Abraham had to offer up Isaac, his son, his only son. God knew that that was a typology and that was a shadow and a picture of what God would do on Mount Moriah with his only begotten son, his own son, all God and all man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He knew that there would be a day coming when he would be on a cross laying his life down for you and I. And our way to the Father would be to look at that cross and believe and surrender our lives to him, letting him be Savior and Lord. Surrender, giving up my life and my will and my plan for God's. Giving up, surrendering. Lord, you are God. I know your son is real. I know I need a Savior. And he's it. Jesus said, if I be lifted up on that cross, I will draw all men to me. The love of God, the amazing cost of that sacrifice draws us draws us to the cross and when we kneel at that cross we get born again when we say yes to Jesus yes to him being Savior yes to him being Lord when we stand up from that cross we are now sons and daughters of God now we're on that path of faith with Abraham if you've never kneeled at that cross in your heart if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to him God brought you here today for a very specific purpose. He knew you before you were created. He knew you were in your mother's womb. He knows where you're at. He is not in shock over your mess or your sin or the things you've done as horrific as they might be. He loves you. The only way to be forgiven and the only way to him is through Jesus Christ, his son. Well, Pastor Debbie, what do I need to do? Well, in a moment, I'm going to ask if you need to get right with God. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand like this. Yeah, we're going to have heads up and eyes open. And that's because we're just a little, a little blunt at the rock. I just didn't see anywhere when Peter gave the first altar call that he had everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. You see, Christianity is not for cowards because you're not just assenting to Jesus as Lord. You're saying yes to him. I'm going to surrender my life to you. You will be my Lord. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me, I'll deny you. How can you walk out those doors and live for Jesus Christ in a hostile world if you can't be willing to say yes to him in a church that has prayed you in and loves you? So don't let one moment of embarrassment or shame stop you from receiving the Lord this morning. So if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, I'm talking to you. If you're one of those that have been a rascal like I was in my young years, just horrible, 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 stupid, stupid, stupid. If you're one of those, those rascals, I'm really talking to you because you can't fix you, but he can. And he is the only one that can. If you're one of those people that were better than I'll ever dream of being, but you've just never made that decision. You've been to church. You've done religious things. You've done good works. You've tried to behave and be a good a good child, a good human being on the planet. I'm talking to you because your good works can't get you to heaven. There's only one way. It's through his son, Jesus Christ. So I'm going to count to three. I'm going to hit my, my notebook. Now, when my husband does this, it's really, really loud. When I do it, it's really wimpy. Wham, like that. So you got to listen. I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. We're going to do it all together. Are you ready? You've been running from him instead of to him. This is your moment. 
Been a rascal, this is really your moment. Been a good person, you need to get right with God too. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. One, two, I see that hand. I see, keep them high, let me see them. I see that hand. I see that hand. Okay, wave at me because I don't have my glasses on. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I gotcha. I gotcha. I can't see past the fifth row. I just see blur. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to gather all of the stuff that you brought to church. Purses, Bibles. If you brought a friend or a friend brought you, you can bring them down the aisle. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing this song. And as if you raise your hand, I'm talking to you. If you raise your hand and you meet it, I want you to slip out of the aisle. Come down. Meet me at the front. We're going to get right with God. We're going to change destinies today. So will you stand with me? Come. Let's get right with God. If you didn't raise your hand or if I didn't seem like I saw you, just come on down anyway. There'll be people here. Let's get right with God. And I surrender all. And I surrender How much he loves us. How much he loves us. So nobody else leave. This is an important and a solemn time in the sanctuary. Come quickly, come quickly. Pick up the pace. It's not too late to come, to slip out of the aisles. Just come, just come. He's the only one that can change you. He's the only one. Because he made you and he loves you. Okay, now you all have to smile at me because you're not going to a funeral. You're coming to a birthday party. Your birthday party. Amen. Look at you. Are you beautiful or what? Oh, my gosh. This is Pastor Joel. We're going we're gonna to pray with you in the New Believers room because it's a private thing, and we want to just give you a little book my husband wrote. It's real simple, but it's really good because... Now that you're going to be born again and you're going to say yes to Jesus, you need to know some things. And we want to offer you a spiritual personal trainer who's a friend. You don't have to say yes to a spiritual personal trainer, but we encourage you to because you're going to have somebody you can call and ask questions to, and they're going to teach you five things. But what I really want to say is that this is a family. God put us in community together. He made families. And now that you're getting born again and you're saying yes to Jesus, you need a family to love you and care for you. So we'd like to volunteer. If you give us a year of your life, I promise, I promise, you'll never be the same when you meet Jesus in that year. So if you could just turn. This is Pastor Joel. He's awesome. You're lovely. Well done. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.